obviously uh, Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, uh, former Anne Arundel County Executive uh, Steve Hsu from our COVID-19 Task Force, who has been leading our outreach and communication with county leaders, and Dr. Ted Delbridge, who is the Executive Director of the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services Systems. Last week, we held a uh, press conference warning about the fall coronavirus surge, which is raging across the country. And I said that the upticks in some of our metrics uh, and the spiking numbers in other states uh, placed us once again at a pivotal moment in this fight. Since last week, most of our key metrics have worsened considerably. Uh, we're now seeing widespread community transmission, not just in our cities and urban and suburban areas, but in our rural counties that had not experienced the large spikes earlier this year. More people are getting infected with the virus, more people are being hospitalized, more people are going into intensive care, and more Marylanders are dying. We have uh, now had seven straight days with more than 1,000 cases, and those numbers continue to rise. Today, the Maryland Department of Health is reporting another 1,338 new cases of the virus. Yesterday, our seven-day statewide positivity rate reached 5.05, .05, crossing the, over the 5% mark, which is the key benchmark set by the World Health Organization and the CDC, for the first time in 137 days since June 25th. Today, our positivity rate increased once again to 5.24%. And it has now been slowly rising for the past 19 days. 11 of our 24 jurisdictions now have positivity rates which have gone above that 5% benchmark, including Allegheny County, Anne Arundel, Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Charles, Dorchester, Garrett, Harford, Queen Anne's, Somerset, and Washington counties. Nationwide, COVID-19 hospitalizations surged to a record high yesterday, with over 59,000 patients hospitalized. Here in Maryland, our total COVID hospitalizations are at 761, which is their highest level since June 13th. 176 patients are in the ICU, which is the highest level since June 27th. Uh, we have also now moved into the red zone as designated by the federal government for the number of cases per 100,000. Last week, our average case rate was at 14.5. Today, it has risen to 19.8. It has increased 36% in just the past seven days. Case rates are now above 10 in 18 of our 24 jurisdictions and above 20 cases per 100,000 in seven jurisdictions, including Allegheny County, Washington County, Baltimore County, Baltimore City, Harford, and Arundel and Somerset County. Allegheny County's case rate has continued to grow exponentially. Uh, last week, uh, last Thursday, we announced that we would be standing up a new testing site uh, at the Allegheny County Fairgrounds, and I'm pleased to report that this new site will be fully operational tomorrow. Uh, more people are dying from this virus, including now 4,084 Marylanders and nearly 245,000 Americans. We have been and are still doing much better than 40 other states in our health metrics. But as I have repeatedly said, this deadly virus does not recognize state borders. Our updated contact tracing continues to indicate that family gatherings are the most common and therefore the highest risk activity among those who were recently infected with COVID-19. 
Among those who were recently infected with COVID-19, there's an increased number who recently tested positive. Uh, the report working outside of their home, a marked increase in the number of people uh, infected with the virus who say they've recently dined indoors at a restaurant, as well as a large increase of those who have recently traveled out of state. We cannot afford to ignore these trends and patterns. Um, last week I said that warning lights were starting to blink on the dashboard uh, and that it appeared we were approaching a critical turning point in the fight. Today I'm reporting that we have now crossed over into the danger zone. Too many residents and businesses have COVID fatigue and they've begun letting their guard down. Too many Marylanders are traveling out of state to unsafe locations, hosting large gatherings, crowding in bars, attending house parties, and refusing to wear masks. Too many businesses are failing to comply uh, with the state regulations and orders, and counties with the primary responsibility for ensuring compliance of the law and enforcing public health regulations are, in some cases, failing to do so. Sadly, as a result, the virus has returned to our state in a big way. We absolutely must and we will continue to use every tool at our disposal. From day one of the pandemic, I have never hesitated to take the actions that I believed were necessary to keep the people of Maryland safe, and I will continue to do so. Uh, we do not want to take actions that will further burden our struggling small businesses or actions to shut down our economy. Our primary goals continue to be uh, keeping our hospitals from overflowing and stopping more Marylanders from dying. Today, I am announcing that effective tomorrow, uh, November 11th at 5 o'clock p.m., so roughly 24 hours from now, the capacity for indoor operations at bars and restaurants will be reduced from 75% back to 50%. Bars and restaurants in Maryland have only been permitted to open for seated, distanced service only with strict capacity restrictions. No standing in bars has been allowed. Patrons have been required to spread the tables at least six feet apart and no large groups uh, larger than six per table. Now, many of those are not being followed. Uh, customers who are not seated cannot be served, and tables must be cleaned and disinfected between each seating in accordance with guidelines from the CDC and the Maryland Department of Health. This order will be enforced. In addition, uh, today the Maryland Department of Health is issuing a new public health advisory, strongly warning against any indoor gatherings of 25 people or more. This is consistent with all of our contact tracing data and an uptick in cases resulting from uh, family gatherings and house parties. It's easy to feel comfortable thinking that just because you haven't engaged in any of the activities that we typically think of uh, as high risk, that it's enough to keep us safe. Uh, the, the reality is that you can just as easily get the virus by hosting a group of friends to watch football on Sunday, or celebrating a family birthday, or the Thanksgiving holiday that's fast approaching. Uh, each of us has to be more ca uh, cautious and more vigilant. The Maryland Department of Health today is also issuing an expanded advisory regarding all out-of-state travel, uh, which according to our contact tracing data is responsible for a substantial increased number of cases. Under this expanded travel advisory, all Marylanders are strongly advised against all non-essential out-of-state travel to any of the eight states with a positivity rate above 10 percent or any of the 35 states with average case rates of above 20 per 100,000. Uh, this applies to all personal, family, or business travel of any kind. Uh, you should immediately postpone or cancel travel to any of these states 
with spiking metrics. Anyone who has to travel outside the state for an essential reason uh, upon their return to Maryland should immediately get tested for COVID-19 and self-quarantine while awaiting the results of the test. Effective immediately, all state employees who uh, are approved to telework must again begin a period of mandatory telework. Uh, except for essential, direct, public-facing services and other essential personnel. Earlier today, I convened an emergency teleconference of my entire cabinet and uh, directed them to immediately execute this period of mandatory telework among the employees in their agencies. And we are strongly advising all employers across the state to limit uh, their workforce only to workers who are essential and who are not able to telework. Uh, businesses are strongly encouraged to develop plans which limit the proximity of employees by rotating employee hours, instituting split schedules, shifts, shorter work weeks, or staggering start, break, or shift times. The Maryland Department of Health is issuing an emergency order today to activate the next level of our hospital surge capacity by adding alternative care site capacity and uh, to provide additional staffing support and clinical care to nursing homes in the event of further outbreaks. These emergency plans will be activated immediately uh, when our hospitalizations reach a critical threshold. Uh, finally, the Maryland Department of Health is issuing updated guidance stop the spread of COVID-19 at nursing homes and assisted living facilities. To protect our loved ones, uh, Marylanders should take all precautions, including all visitors being tested prior to visiting a nursing home facility. Nursing home and assisted living program staff must minimize their contact and avoid all gatherings and work with their management on communicating early and often about all infection control issues at their facilities. We're also requiring all nursing homes to develop a sufficient PPE stockpile for the winter surge. The actions that we're taking today are necessary based on all of the numbers, uh, the data, metrics, and projections, and are being taken in consultation with the top doctors and public health experts from our Maryland Coronavirus Recovery Task Force. These actions are absolutely necessary to help us withstand this surge, to save lives, and to keep Maryland on the road to recovery and open for business. This must be an all-hands-on-deck effort. I want to be very clear that all of our existing health orders and our new health orders uh, are in effect and do carry the full force of law. Uh, failure to follow them will result in serious consequences. It is absolutely vital that uh, county leaders and their county health departments, county liquor boards, county licensing and permitting departments, as well as county and municipal law enforcement agencies, um, they have the primary responsibility uh, to strictly enforce these restrictions and orders to the letter of the law. And we have asked them to immediately ramp up their enforcement efforts. All violators uh, should be warned. They run the risk of jail time, fines, and the likelihood of actions being taken regarding their liquor licenses or other county business licenses or even the businesses being closed uh, for failure to comply. I want to commend Baltimore City and Anne Arundel County for the recent enforcement actions they have taken to close facilities that were willfully violating the orders and refusing to follow state law. As we brace for the impact of this surge, uh, the state has already invested a half billion dollars in economic recovery funding, and we are working around the clock in partnership with our county governments uh, to get that relief quickly. Uh, out to in order in order to help even more struggling families and small businesses. 
We also want the counties to recognize the importance of immediately stepping up the pace of their relief efforts. Uh, Maryland Secretary of Health Bobby Neal and Budget Secretary David Brinkley sent a letter to all county leaders and local health departments warning them that the deadline for state and local governments to spend the Federal CARES Act funding is December 30th this year, uh, and that their constituents will lose out on this critical funding if it is not spent in the next 50 days. Uh, we have held 22 calls with all of the county leaders, meeting every two weeks. We will be increasing that to weekly calls with all local leaders, and we will be working with them on their efforts to enforce state law, uh, to provide whatever assistance we possibly can to them, and to help them to get this uh, critically uh, needed funding dispersed to the people who desperately need it. I want to again remind local leaders that state law grants them the power, the authority, and the flexibility to implement more restrictive policies than the state orders if they deem necessary, based on the changing conditions in their individual jurisdictions in order to slow the spread of the virus. They can and they should take those actions, and local leaders will have our full support. The state of Maryland will continue to constantly monitor all of the metrics, uh, and uh, we may need to take additional statewide actions in the days and the weeks ahead if the situation continues to deteriorate. In closing, I just want to remind uh, the people of Maryland that we have come too far and the stakes are too high. Um, this virus does not care if you're tired of it. It does not care if you have holiday plans. It doesn't care who you voted for. And it will not let us move on just because we all desperately want to get back to our normal pre-COVID lives. Uh, Marylanders crushed the curve once before, and we can and we will do it again with your help. Um, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ted uh, Delbridge, who, as I said, is the executive director of the Maryland Institute for Emergency Medical Services and Systems, to discuss the, uh, the Maryland uh, Department of Health order, uh, ongoing preparations for additional surge capacity, and the new alternative care sites. Doctor. Good evening. As a board certified emergency physician for the past 27 years, let me begin, Governor Hogan, by expressing my appreciation for your leadership during this challenging time. Thank you. Because of executive orders you issued early in the pandemic, we have been able to do important work to respond to COVID-19 and prepare for the next phases. Among them were, we provisionally credentialed more than 1,000 new EMS clinicians to make them available in the field. These people are emergency medical technicians and paramedics who were students at the end of training, practicing in other states, or re-engaged after expiring. We credentialed more than 800 nursing students and respiratory care students as clinical externs, making them available within the healthcare system. They get valuable clinical experiences, we get enthusiasm and their caring expertise. We issued a viral syndrome pandemic triage protocol, helping our EMTs and paramedics identify patients who might be safely cared for at home. We established a model that has been emulated in other states. For the past several months, MEMS has been charged with helping to maintain situational awareness, working daily with our state's hospitals to monitor COVID resource utilization and ongoing availability to meet the demands. At the outset of this pandemic, one of Governor Hogan's first actions was to operationalize a plan to ensure that capacity existed to accommodate a surge of no fewer than 6,000 COVID-19 patients in our hospitals. Anticipating a resurgence of COVID-19 in Maryland this fall and winter, we have maintained all of those measures. However, there are meaningful differences from this past spring. We know more about the virus, the illness it causes, and effective treatments. In general, hospitals already have more patients, though. Many people deferred elective procedures and health care in the spring and summer and are receiving them now. Flu season has begun, and some people with the flu are going to emergency departments and requiring hospitalization. I cannot overemphasize the critical importance of getting a flu vaccine. For each of us, it's valuable for our own health and for those around us, and it's not too late. 
Therefore, as Governor Hogan just announced, we are issuing an emergency health order that essentially activates our next level of surge planning. I want to briefly walk through what it does and what it means. Our basic goal is to help manage hospital capacity so that people affected with COVID-19 are able to get the care they need without overloading any single hospital and to ensure that all Marylanders have access to routine health care without excessive delay. First, the order emphasizes the importance of shifting appropriate patients to specialized care sites at the Baltimore Convention Center, Laurel Hospital, and Tacoma Park Hospital. It provides agility to increase capacity at those sites if the need arises. Second, the order requires hospitals to implement their surge plans. Hospitals should be optimizing the use of staff and space to ensure they are prepared for the predicted increase in COVID-19 patients. They must also be prepared to accommodate newly arriving emergency patients. We will work closely with Maryland's hospitals to ensure we have accurate, real-time assessments of available acute care and intensive care resources, helping to make certain we are caring for Marylanders as best we can. Third, as an additional nursing home resident protection strategy, we make more infection control staff available from regional hospitals if an outbreak occurs. We can be confident of two things. One, the threat of COVID is not behind us, it is quite real. And two, the entirety of Maryland's healthcare system is ready for the next battle. For more than nine months, fighting the fight along with countless talented people, what consistently strikes me is their shared spirit of determination and their commitment to making sure Marylanders are well cared for. We all need to maintain the same degree of vigilance. Now is not the time for complacency, as Governor Hogan described. The virus affects people with tremendous variability. You may be infected and contagious before you realize it. As we know too well, many people may die. We are in a marathon and not a sprint. Please don't give up. Basic steps help tremendously and reduce the risks for everyone. Please wear a mask a damn mask if you have one. Wash your hands often and keep your own hands away from your face. Finally, be mindful and watch your distance from others. We're ready for whatever comes ahead, but we need everyone's help. Thank you. Uh, thank you, doctor. I, I, I'm afraid I've got people using bad language now after my last <laughs> week, and I didn't mean to corrupt you like that, but uh, yeah, thank you. Any, any questions, Tom? Governor, I'm curious, why did you Well, so, uh, you know, I went through some of the metrics. Uh, we saw some of this happening. Uh, we just crossed over yesterday into this 5%. And we think these are the targeted actions that we need to take right now today based on the data from where we're seeing the infection and what our contact tracing is telling us that these are the things that are going to have the biggest impact. Uh, but as I said, this doesn't mean um, this is the end. I mean, we're going to continue to take actions uh, you know, if need be, every day until we, you know, get this figured out. We keep ch watching it every day. Hogan, yeah. um, hey. Some of them sound uh, more like strong suggestions rather than mandates. For example, to put the limit on uh, gatherings in of 25 people or more and travel out of state. Did you consider making this a, a mandate keep no exceptions? Yeah. I, well, so uh, it was about half and half. Some of them were. Um, uh, reiterating existing orders and saying we need to up, step up the enforcement because we've had them in place, but people were not following them. Some of it were new actual orders that, were, that we, we do have the force of law. In other cases, the enforcement is difficult, and so uh, there are public health advisories that are just providing people the information they need to make the best decisions and strongly encouraging and advising them to follow the rules. Um, but, you know, we'll take whatever further actions that we deem necessary uh, if the situation continues. Yeah. You know, we're actually talking about, uh, uh, we didn't address uh, the congregations at all because they're all in, under different orders with masking and distancing as opposed to a gathering of 25 people that sometimes are not. So it didn't, it didn't, we did not change at this point any rules on religious gatherings.
Yeah, Adam Rundle in Baltimore City. Well, I don't want to call everybody out. I mean, we just, we, most of our businesses are doing a great job of complying. Most of the business sectors, you know, we, our Department of Commerce has 17 different work groups with a couple of hundred people that are developing safe plans. They're trying to keep their members following the rules. M many of the, you know, counties are doing their best. Uh, but there's becoming more and more lax, uh, you know, people, they, they may have forgotten that the rules are in place or they don't think it's important anymore. They think that we're safe now because our numbers were doing so much better than the rest of the country that it was over. But many of those orders still remain in place. It's just that people aren't following it. So we have, you know, uh, instances of uh, jam-packed bars and restaurants when they have never been able to stand in a bar even. <laughs> You're only allowed to sit and get a drink spaced out. Uh, a lot of people are not following those rules. And the, 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 the county liquor inspectors who are in there anyway doing other things uh, and um, you know, local health departments and uh, local law enforcement, they, they, they provide licenses to all these businesses. They, they've got to start kind of dropping a hammer on the bad apples uh, because that's where a lot of the spread has taken place. <laughs> So we, we really look at all the metrics. Really, our positivity is better than 43 other states. For example, South Dakota is at 54% right now, 54.6%. We're at five. This, you know, it's, it's, it's not as alarming, but we don't like the way it's heading. Um, we're not in the red zone for positivity. 10 is the, 10 is the, is the rate that they put at you. The federal government says you're in the red zone. We're saying don't travel to the states that have 10%. Um, but on the number of cases, which is two different metrics, we just did cross in in, a, in the past few days. Uh, again, we're not to pick on South Dakota, but they're number one in both categories. They have 186.5 cases per 100,000, and we just went to 19. So in both cases, almost 10 times worse. And there are 38 states worse than us on case rates and 40, I, I think 43 states worse than us on positivity. But we are heading in the wrong direction and I've been talking with many of our experts and talking with my fellow governors. They saw it go from here to slight and then shoot straight up. And so we're trying to take these measured steps to stop that from happening. So um, I did the early calls before we set up, uh, you know, our entire uh, mechanism for dealing with them and on an ongoing daily basis. We put former county executive in charge of the group, all of our cabinet. Uh, I think we have daily calls with the health leaders and with many of their other departments, and we have uh, calls every two weeks with our entire state leadership team talking with them. So um, they all, if it, they haven't brought up a single concern at any of those calls, including the one we had last week. I know that five of the, the ones uh, who are in, all Democrats, by the way, and many of them looking at statewide office, sent a letter, a press release out, but they haven't expressed any concerns to us. Nonetheless, we're going to double the number of meetings to see if that will, you know, make them happier. Who said that? Yeah, I didn't hear that one. Uh, look, I, I've made my feelings on this pretty clear. Um, I, I think if the president and his team have real evidence of widespread voter fraud, they should come forward with it. Um, they certainly, we have legal processes for a reason. They can be challenged. They have, they have every right to do that. Um, uh, but I haven't seen any widespread evidence, and I don't, haven't seen anything that would in any way change the outcome of the election. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you know, this is the way it works in America. We, we cast the votes, we count the votes, and we live with the results. And I think most people realize that uh, this election is over. It's really dangerous, I think, 
uh, to, uh, in the middle of this pandemic. It's economic collapse, people dying across the country to not know if we're gonna have a transition, is the old coronavirus task force gonna be making decisions? Is the new one? There's no transition. How long is this gonna go on? With no stimulus package getting done, with, with no additional virus relief, with, you know, it's crazy. We've gotta move on. Uh, so, two, two part question. Uh, yeah, I was the first uh, statewide Republican uh, or, you know, Republican leader, I guess, to come out and congratulate uh, the, pres the president elect on his victory. Uh, but a number of my fellow governors and a few senators and 30 some Republican congressmen and others and many former elected officials and pre pre uh, President Bush, um, you know, Chris Christie, Rick Santorum, there are a lot of people saying, that the election is over and that congratulating the, the vice president-elect meant even more do not want to stop the transition from happening. Um, I was disappointed, frankly, and I said so uh, earlier, uh, with uh, the, some of the response from uh, Leader McConnell uh, and others who have a different, you know, are taking a completely different take on it. And I think it's a mistake. Um, I think it's a mistake for uh, the country. It's a mistake for the Republican Party, and especially as we have the Senate hanging in the balance in two uh, runoff elections in Georgia, uh, doing anything to tarnish the brand and have, you know, cost us votes is a pretty, pretty uh, significant thing. Governor, what's on your advice today uh, in regards to the surging numbers? What's your advice to local school systems around the state about returning to class, keeping things online? There seem to be a mishmash of rules and uh, things that are happening. What, what's your advice to the, the parents out there who don't know what to make of the latest, the latest surge? Sure. Um, so uh, we have very clear uh, state guidelines and metrics. Um, our superintendent, uh, state superintendent of edu education and our, our uh, public health uh, assistant secretary have been in constant communication with local school boards, just like we have with the county leaders. Um, we've given them by, uh, advice about, you know, how we can safely get some kids that are in most need, special needs kids, for example, people that have no access to the Internet who are really suffering. Uh, without any you know, instruction for quite some time, that we can still try to do that. Uh, but again, the legal authority lies with the school boards, and they are making decisions uh, as they're right, you know, they have the right to do. And I think they ought to continue to follow as, you know, the, the, the advice uh, and look at the metrics on the ground and where they are. In some places, they have done it very successfully with limited uh, people back in school with little or no uh, issues whatsoever, but we have, you know, real. Any time there's any kind of an outbreak or a problem, you know, they they can take quick action. Governor, what is your governor on the radio interview? You expressed some reluctance to uh, go back to closing businesses, closing down the economy. What do you make of that? Today, are you putting businesses on notice that if this doesn't get turned around, you're likely to do that? And also, do you have any comment on reports that uh, Secretary uh, Bobby Neal is going to retire from the health department at the end of the month? Sure. Uh, first of all, we still have 100% of all of our businesses open. Um, we've had 98% of them open since June. Uh, that's a good thing. Uh, they're safely reopened with, you know, uh, important restrictions and guidelines to keep people safe. But it's helped us also be one of the best economies in the country, 20% better than the country, better again than 40-some states. Um, you know, we've got a tremendous amount of unemployment, although our unemployment rate is lower than m most people. It's twice what it used to be before this started. Um, uh, but so we're trying to keep people employed. We're trying to keep small businesses from um, and from failing and, and going under. But we also are trying to keep people alive, and that's the delicate balance. So we still have all of our businesses open. We didn't do any kind of drastic uh, shutdowns or lockdowns. But we've just had what we think are reasonable, measured, and critically needed steps right now. Uh, you know, we've got to enforce the laws, the rules we have, and we've got to add a few more to make it even safer. Governor, um, this may be an question. In the spring, before we were wearing our darn masks, um, uh, thank you for saying darn. <laughs> right. I was joking about something else. <laughs>
Well, that's a really good question, and I may turn it over to Dr. Delbridge because we had this discussion just a couple of days ago, and I think his his caution to us was that we should expect, you know, December and January could be, uh, you know, the worst part. And, and I don't want to steal his wording. I'll let him answer. But it, that before we, we peaked and came back down, we did another little one in June and came back down, that this one is more of a stay at this level for a while, right? Yes. I mean, I'm going to steal your... Your thunder here, Doctor. Uh, that's exactly right. I, I think when we look at the modeling, we're concerned that December, January, and February are going to be the peak times. And uh, so much is dependent on the mitigating steps that the public takes, things like wearing a mask and keeping distance and those kinds of things. And so those, the effects of those are a little bit more challenging to predict. Uh, but we, when we see what the trajectory is now, we are uh, definitely concerned that this is a longer-lasting uh, peak that's going to go into the winter months. Some have correlated the uh, the um, virulence of the virus uh, with changes in humidity, and as they've tracked it in other places in the world, note that as humidity drops, as the weather changes, it becomes more of a problem. Um, and so we're thinking along those lines, which is which is why it is just so incredibly important. I, I, I can't miss this opportunity to reiterate that people get a flu shot. Uh, because if it just it just makes them comorbid, gives them another problem to have, uh, and keeps people out of the hospital with the flu that that spares space for other people that need it. Last question. Actually, I don't think I answered uh, the other half of his question. Sorry about that, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, so we weren't ready to announce this yet today, but I, I can confirm. Uh, we just had a emergency cabinet meeting this afternoon where. Um, Secretary Bobby Neal, who has been a longtime friend for decades and who's done an incredible job leading a wonderful team of people throughout this crisis, um, he gave us uh, a notice announced to the cabinet and to us that he will be um, leaving uh, the administration, retiring on December 1st. Uh, and, uh, you know, I don't have any further details on that, but we will in the coming uh, weeks as we get closer. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Doctor. Good job. Thank you. Steve.